the seven psychological needs revealed in the book of Genesis chapter 2 so that we can have a lifetime of health, happiness, and well-being. Whether you like it or not, brothers and sisters, God wants us to be happy. Did you know that? And if you want to be happy, if you want to have a lifetime of well-being, what we need to do is to turn to our Creator. Because after all, He was the one who created us. So if there's anyone who knows how we tick, how we function, it would be God Himself. And so if you want to have a lifetime of health, happiness, and well-being, we need to turn to God's blueprint revealed here in chapter 2 of the book of Genesis. So let's begin with need number one. Next slide, please. Genesis chapter 2, 1 down to 3. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. After six days of creation, what did God do on the seventh? The Bible said, or says, God rested. Does it mean God needs physical rest? Absolutely not. Why then does the Bible tell us that on the seventh day, God rested? Because he wanted to model for us how we should function in relation to our work and our rest. In other words, God wants to tell us if we want to function well at work, we need to rest. This is why, what did God ask Moses to do concerning rest? Let's read the book of Exodus 20, verse 11. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. How did God show the importance of rest. God included the day of rest in his 10 commandments. This is why he said, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. God is telling us we need rest. Our body and mind needs rest. And what did the Lord Jesus Christ say about the Sabbath day and the day of rest? Let's look at the, the book of Mark 2, 27, 28. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. What did the Lord Jesus Christ say about the Sabbath or day of rest? Christ said to the Pharisees, he said to them that the Sabbath or day of rest was created to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. You see, prior to the captivity there in Babylon, the Sabbath day of rest was functioning well for the people of God. However, after the captivity, because of Babylonian influence, they added rules when it comes to the Sabbath. This is why they have so many different added rules that man made up, man made rules, and they use that to kind of constrict people, what they can and cannot do on the day of the Sabbath, the Lord Jesus Christ is against that kind of dogmatism. Christ said the purpose of the Sabbath, the purpose of the day of rest is for our benefit. Now, how does the Bible illustrate the need for rest? Let's read here the book of 1 Kings 19, 3 down to 5. Elijah. How many here remember Elijah? Do you like him as a prophet? Yeah, I love Elijah. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. We knew him to be a courageous prophet, right? It was just him against the King Ahab and all of his cohorts, all of his minions. He was the only one who stood up against Jezebel. Elijah, however, point in his life came when he became afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. So here's the prophet Elijah. 
We know him to be a bold preacher, one with the spirit of our almighty God. He preached against the evil king Ahab. He preached against Jezebel. However, there was a point in life when he wanted to give up, right? Did you notice his prayer? What did he say? I have had enough. He said, take my life for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Do you feel like that sometimes? When you say to yourself, I have had enough. One bad news after another, one insult after another. Perhaps some of you can relate because of events taking place in our life. Elijah was a prophet, yes, but he was also a human being like you and I. And so when he was pressured, when overwhelming burdens came upon him, what did he do? He went to sleep. <laughs> he went to sleep. And after he slept, everything was back to normal. You know, sometimes all we need is some sleep. You're having a big problem. You're having anxiety attacks. Why not take the time to get some rest? Get some sleep. Sometimes that will be the best medicine. Who also recognize the need for rest and sleep, especially after a long, hard day of work. Let's uh, look at Mark 6, 30 to 32. The apostles returned and met with Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. There were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. So he said to them, let us go off by ourselves to some place where we will be alone and you can rest a while. So they, they started out in a boat by themselves to a lonely place. They recognized the need for sleep, the need for rest. Our Lord Jesus Christ, his disciples were busy working all day long. And so what did the Lord Jesus Christ recommend for them to do? Let's go off by ourselves to some place where we will be alone and you can rest a while. And so we need rest. Without proper sleep, our mind and our body will not function as it should. And when the researchers of science looked into the need and power of sleep, this is what they came up with. According to verywellhealth.com, 10 benefits of sleep. This is why I recommend you get enough sleep. I don't know what is enough sleep for you, but for me, it's eight hours. For most people, it is also eight hours. And so when you get enough sleep, these are the following health benefits. Number one, sleep reduces, um, keeps your, healthy, your heart healthy. Number two, sleep may prevent cancer. <laughs> wow. Sleep reduces stress. Sleep reduces inflammation. Sleep makes you more alert. Sleep improves your memory. Sleep may help you lose weight. That's a big one. Right. Napping makes you smarter. Sleep may reduce your risk of depression. And sleep helps the body repair itself. God wants us to sleep. We cannot be happy, healthy, and experience well-being unless we have enough sleep and we have enough rest in our life. We know about the power of sleep, but there's another kind of rest that is supernatural in its nature. What is that? Let's turn to the book of Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What will give us supernatural rest, especially when we experience stressful situations throughout our day? We need our Lord Jesus Christ. I like the invitation of Christ to all of us. What does he say? He says, come to me. What does it mean for us to go to Christ? It means to take up his yoke. You see, the illustration here is a yoke, a wooden beam that connects two oxen together. One is a lead oxen. One is a servant oxen. When you yoke up with a lead oxen, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to yield to the lead oxen. Let him take the lead. Christ is telling us, I want to be that lead. 
In other words, if we want rest from our Lord Jesus Christ, we have to accept his yoke. What does that mean? We need to be united with him. We need to make him as our leader. And when we do that, he will be the one in charge of the hard stuff. In other words, we can find rest in Christ Jesus when we decide to make him the leader of our life. In everything we do, when we give everything to Christ, we will find rest in Christ Jesus. So that is need number one. What is need number two? Genesis again, chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils. And the man became a living person. And so when God created man, it came from the dust of the ground. And then he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living being. So with the creation of man, it was very personal, right? Because when God created the heavens and the earth, he did not breathe it into existence. But here, he breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life. It was personal for our almighty God. Why? Because he wanted man and woman to be a spiritual being. This is why human beings are different categorically from animals. Human beings are spiritual beings. What does that mean? Only human beings can have a relationship with God. Need number two is our spiritual connection with God. When we lose that spiritual connection with God, doesn't matter how much rest you have. We're not going to be healthy and happy. Well, how can we have this spiritual connection with God? Let's read the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 14. Through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in us, keep the good things that have been entrusted to you. How can we have the spiritual connection with God? By receiving the Holy Spirit that lives in us. When we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we are connected to our almighty God. And that makes a big difference in our life. However, how can we ensure that we are connected with God, that we are aware of the presence of God? Let's turn to the book of Psalms 46 and the verses 10. It says, Be still and know that i am god there are times when we just have to pause and take what i call a blessing break you know our society today is the most distracted society in the history of the world you know why we have so many what distractions right you got hbo you got internet, you got YouTube, you got uh, Facebook. What else you got? Instagram, right? We're so distracted. This is why it's so hard to be still and remove the distraction. Why should we be still and remove the distraction? Because otherwise, we would not be able to know or hear from our all Mighty God. You know why? We need to remove distractions and be focused on the presence of God. Let's read the book of Kings 19, 11 to 13. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and the mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Why do we need to be still to be able to know our almighty God? Because for us to be able to sense the presence of God, we have to listen so closely, like listening to a gentle whisper. Because God wanted to show Elijah his presence. And so it started out with a windstorm so powerful, it pulverized the mountains. But the Bible says the Lord was not in that wind. And then there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But then there was a gentle 
whisper. And the Lord was manifested there. This is why, brothers and sisters, if we want to sense the presence of God, we need to be still, we need to be quiet, we need to be prepared to listen. You know, God will not lead us. God will not manifest himself in our life unless we take the time to listen to him. This is why, brothers and sisters, we want you to develop times with God where it's just you and God and learn to listen to God because God wants, God wants to communicate with us. But if we don't take the time to listen to him, you won't be able to listen to his voice. You know why it's so important for us to be aware of the presence of God, which is what spirituality is all about in the first place. Let's read the book of Psalms 16, 7 to 9. I praise the Lord because he guides me. And in the night, my conscience warns me. I am always aware of the Lord's presence. He is near and nothing can shake me. And so I am thankful and glad and, I'm, and I feel completely secure. When we are spiritual, we are aware of the presence of God. And when we are aware of the presence of God, when we know he is near us by our side, the Bible says nothing can shake us. Don't we need that right now? There's so many things in life that can shake us. But if we're aware of the presence of God, it'll be a piece of cake. These things that happen in our life will never shake us. This is why we need to have this presence of God. We need to develop an awareness of God with us at all times. You know who the best example is of having God with them? And because of the spirituality, they were not, he was not shaken at all. Let's read the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, 20 to 23. And I believe this is very relevant to all of us. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you are beaten for doing wrong. If you do something wrong and bad things happen to you, don't be surprised, right? Right? The Bible says, but if, okay, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow his steps. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was, what does it say? <laughs> Insulted, nor threatened revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. You know, how can we tell? If a person is spiritual, when bad things happen to him, he remains calm. When people insult him, he doesn't take revenge. He remains calm. He endures it. Why? He follows the example of Christ, the most spiritual person who ever lived. This is why we can tell if a person really has the Spirit of God in him, if he's close to God. He's not phased. He's not shaken by all of the chaos that happens in his life. He's not moved by all of the distractions that happens in his life. Why? Because he's close to God. You know, when you're close to God, you're not going to be perturbed when bad things happen to you. When people talk behind your back, it will not move you. It will not hurt you. Why? Because you're so close to God. The closer you are to God, the more stable you will be. You have that calm that surpasses all understanding amidst the storm and chaos that may happen. In our life. This is why, brethren, we cannot be truly happy unless we have spirituality or connection with our almighty God. Because in life, there's a lot of negativity, right? You go to school, a lot of negativity. Am I right? You go to, you go to your place of work, there's a lot of negativity. And it's hard for us to absorb all that. But we can if God is close to each and every one of us okay all right what's need number three genesis 2 8 down to 9 then the lord god planted a garden in eden in the east and there he placed the man he had made the lord god made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit in the middle of the garden he placed a tree of life and a tree of knowledge of good and evil the gold of that land is exceptionally pure aromatic resin and onyx stone are also found there. 
So here, you notice, when God created man, where did he place him at? A garden or a desert? A garden. What kind of trees did he create? Ugly or beautiful? Beautiful. What kind of fruit did he give? Delicious or bland? Delicious. You know what this tells us? God wants us to enjoy life. This is why God placed the first man in paradise, right? Garden of Eden must have been a beautiful place because God is a God of beauty, a God of orderliness. This is why I, I believe, even though we cannot see the Garden of Eden now, it's the most beautiful place on planet Earth. And so need number three is the need for enjoyment. We need to enjoy our life. Is this biblical? Let's read the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and the verses 1. For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. Isn't that a song? Yeah? Anyone here care to sing that song? Who made that song? Is it the Beatles? Yeah? No? It was not the Beatles? Okay. It was a song, though. I know, I know that for sure. Verse 12. So I concluded there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can because life is short. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor for these are gifts from God. A lot of people think God wants us to be Sad. In fact, you know, when I went to the congregation of Lancaster, the brethren told me there, the previous, the previous minister told them that, you know, God wants us to be sad here on earth. Yeah, I couldn't believe that. Really? He said that? That God wants us to be sad here on earth so that we can be happy in heaven? No! God wants us to enjoy our life. Why? That is his gift for us. That's why he wants us to enjoy our hard work, to be happy, to enjoy ourselves as long as we can. Life is short, right? So go to that trip in Greece. Why not? Enjoy watching a nice movie together with your family, right? I mean, have you ever met someone who all he did was work? Just work, 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 and work. Have you met someone like that? Yeah? Does he look happy? <laughs> He's probably grouchy, all right? Probably has no friends. He's not going to be happy. We need to learn to enjoy life. God has given us so much. Music to listen to, right? Sceneries to enjoy. Beaches to explore. This is why we should take the time, create the time to enjoy life. How else can we enjoy life? Luke 15, 23, 24, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. We should celebrate moments together, right? Birthday, anniversary, even small things. Like what? The warriors win. <laughs> Hey, let's celebrate. You know, sometimes we can think of so many ways to celebrate. Why not? Look for ways to celebrate with your kids while they're still young. It's what God wants us to do. Because when we enjoy life, when we enjoy what God has given us as a gift, we become better people. And we become better at relationships. So that's another need. And not only... Does it help us psychologically? Next slide. Proverbs 17, 22. Being cheerful keeps you what? Yeah. It is slow death to be gloomy all the time. So if you're always sad, you never smile, you are slowly dying inside. But if you're cheerful, it makes you healthy. Sometimes the best medicine is smile, <laughs> right? Just smile. Why don't you give me a smile right now? <laughs> some of you are smiling and some of you are grinning <laughs> I don't know if that's a smirk but you know when you when you smile and when you laugh it's good for your body it's also good for your mind okay next slide need number four Genesis chapter 2 16 and 17 the Lord God commanded the man he said you are free to eat from any tree in the garden 
but you must never eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because when you eat from it, you will certainly die. You know, at this point of uh, the Bible, God gives the first command. Yeah, it's about what to eat, what not to eat. What did God say? What can you eat? God says you can eat anything you want except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so God is giving us what we call boundaries, right? This is what you can do. There's a lot. But this is what you can't do. That's outside the boundary of God's will. God gives us freedom, yes. But our freedom is not absolute. God gives us a boundary in the form of commands. God says, tell us, tells us to do this, and God tells us not to do that. When God tells us not to do that, when God gives us a boundary, what is his purpose? The Bible says, if you will eat from that tree, you're going to die. So what's the purpose of God's boundaries? Huh? What is it? For our protection. It's like when you have the speed limit on the freeway. What's the purpose of that? Don't go past 70, right? What's the purpose of that? It's for our safety and the safety of other drivers. When God gives us a boundary, it's because he wants to protect us. And so we need the commands of our almighty God. God tells us you can do all this, but not that. But human nature as human beings, next slide, when we see something like this, what do we do? <laughs> right? Wet paint, do not touch. You know, when you put something like that, it's like you're telling him, go touch it. <laughs> That's human nature, right? It's Adam and Eve all over again. It's a good thing we're different, right? The very small remnant is different. When God says yes, yes. When God says no, no way. I hope we're like that because we need to understand when God gives us a command it's for our own good. So what will happen with our life when we agree that God only wants what is best in our life? Let's read Jeremiah 7, 23, 24. This is what I told them. Obey me and I will be your God and you will be my people. Do everything as I say and all will be well. But my people would not listen to me. They kept, they kept doing whatever they wanted, following the stubborn desires of their evil hearts. They went backward instead of forward. According to the prophet Jeremiah, what is the purpose of God in giving us commands? It's for our benefit. You see, God knows exactly what we need. God knows what will work for our life because he created everything. He's the expert knowing what to do. And when God tells us to do something, not to do something, we should obey. But there are people who are called smart Alex, right? They think they know more than God. And so what do they insist to do? Whatever they want. You know, when you insist on doing whatever you want and ignoring the will of God, what's going to happen to our life? The Bible says you're going to go backward and not forward. If we want to go forward, we need to submit to the will of God. When people live by the commands of God, what will be their experience? Psalms 128, 1 to 4. Happy are those who obey the Lord, who live by his commands. Your work will provide for your needs. You'll be happy and prosperous. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine in your home, and your children will be like olive trees around your table. A man who obeys the Lord will surely be blessed like this. This is why the happiest people in the world are not the richest people. Do you know someone who's wealthy and rich? You don't know anyone like that? <laughs> you know, this is a lot of uh, celebrities, a lot of people who are rich, but they're not happy. They even commit suicide, right? I mean, they have everything. You think about it, they have everything. Nice house, nice cars, nice clothes, a swimming pool in the backyard, Mercedes. They have everything. They're miserable. You know what the key to happiness is? It's the word of God. You see, when you follow God, happiness follows you. But when you pursue happiness for the sake of pursuing happiness, you will not be able to find it. And so we need to always obey and live by the commands of our almighty God. That's need number four. Let's go to need number five. Genesis chapter 2, 15, 19, and 20. Then the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and guard it. So he took some soil from the ground and formed all the animals and all the birds. 
Then he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. That is how they all got their names. So the man named all the birds and all the animals, but not one of them was a suitable companion to help him. What do you think is a vital need, psychological need that all human beings need? What do you think it is? Huh? Well, we're not there yet. You're right, but we're not there yet. This is only need number five. <laughs> what do you think? It's right there. Remember, when God created man, he was in paradise, right? It was in paradise. In the plan of God, in paradise, what did God give for him to do? <laughs> Work, <laughs> right? A lot of you think, when I get to heaven, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to be bored. You know, God does not want us to be bored. So he gave us what? Work. He gave meaningful work for Adam to do. Why? Because psychologically, we need work. If you're not going to be doing anything, <laughs> you're going to be what? Bored. You know, bored is stressor, is a stressor. Bored can lead to disease, <laughs> boredom. You know, if you're bored, what do you tend to do, especially nowadays with internet and social media when you're not busy doing good work what do you end up doing you become a busy <laughs> you become a busy body right you know god wants us to work work is good for you psychologically we need to work however the kind of work we need the kind of work god wants us to have next slide is not a job and that's not what god is talking about what is God talking about? A vocation. <laughs> you know there's a difference between a job and a vocation? You know what a job is? What's a job? It's work that you don't really like to do. <laughs> right? Because a lot of times when people work for a living, they have a job. A nine to five job. And so they don't like waking up in the morning, going to their work because it's a job. They don't really like doing it. But a vocation is different. You know what a vocation actually means? A vocation means a calling. See, what God wants us to be engaged in is not a job, but a vocation, a calling. Well, what is a calling? Let's go back to Genesis. Next slide, 2.15. Then the Lord God placed the man in the garden to cultivate and garden. That's his job. Oh, I should say vocation. Then he brought them to the man, the animals and the birds, to see what he would name them. I want to pause there for a while. You see, when it comes to a calling or a vocation, it's something that is unique to you, that you can provide for the benefit of society. In this case, the benefit of the animals, the benefit of the, of, uh, the garden. And so it's something that is uniquely yours, a creative pursuit. God says, I want to see what man will come up with when it comes to naming him. How many here ever produce something original in their life? Like an original composition. How do you feel? Feel good, right? You know, when God said, I will create man in my image, he wants us to be creative because God is creative, right? And so there's something about us that's unique, unique, a talent, a gift. And I was trying to look into my gift and talent, and I tried singing. No. I tried dancing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my wife said, that's it. <laughs> but of course, I can't show that to you today. <laughs> Maybe some other day. But you, you all have gifts. And what God wants us to do is to use that gift for the benefit of people, for the benefit of society. Because when that happens, we get our calling. Next slide. What is a calling? It's when your unique gifts meets a need in society and you make a difference. This is like there was a janitor who worked for 40 years as a janitor in this uh, subway, right? And he didn't mind the low pay. What motivated him was because he felt it was his gift to make sure the people are kept safe by giving sanitary uh, conditions to the bathrooms. He wanted to keep them safe. That's, that's what he felt his calling was, to provide orderliness among the people going in and out because life can be so stressful. And so he found meaning and purpose that became his vocation. Maybe for others, it's just a job, but for him, it was a calling. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. But if you find something that you are good at, and by doing that, you make a difference in society, that's a vocation. And that's the kind of work that we need so that we can have 
a meaningful life. And so according to Apostle Paul, what is an example of work that we should be engaged in? Ephesians 2.10, it is God himself who has made us, just as uh, made us what we are and gave us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. You want to make meaningful work? If you want to contribute to society, you should also focus on helping other people. Okay? Need number six. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it isn't good for man to be alone. I will make a companion for him, a helper suited to his needs. You notice Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, after God creates things, what does he always say? Stars, it's good. Animals, it's good. Man, it's good. And all of a sudden, for the first time, God says, this is not good. <laughs> what did he see? What did God say was not good? When he looked at man, and he was alone. See, God does not want us to be lonely. Human beings were made not to be lonely. Human beings were made for relationship. And so what did God say is good? I'll make a suitable, what? Companion. So need number six is a need for companionship. How important is companionship as human beings? Ecclesiastes 4, 7 and 10. I also observed another piece of foolishness around the earth. Foolishness. <laughs> Here it is. This is the case of a man who is quite alone. What a sad life, right? All alone, sailing alone. What a sad life, right? So he's alone without a son or brother, yet he works hard to keep gaining more riches. Do you know people like that? So focus on material things. He neglects his relationships. And to whom will he leave it all? And why is he giving up so much now? It is also pointless and depressing. Two can accomplish more than twice as much as one. For the results can be much better. If one falls, the other pulls him up. But if a man falls when he is alone, he is in trouble. The Bible tells us why we need companionship. There's a reason why the people of God are likened to sheep. Why? Sheep go together. Sheep are not supposed to be alone. The wolf is alone. Lone wolf. But not lone sheep. When you see lone sheep, what do you call that? Lost. The sheep are supposed to be together. God created human beings to be together, to have companionship. And when it comes to the need for companionship, there's a lot of research on loneliness that's been conducted. And this one from the uh, Public Policy and Aging Report, this is a professional journal, volume 27, issue number 4, 2017. This is what they came up with in a study of about loneliness. Because even though there's internet and all that, you would be astounded with how many people are lonely today. Right? You can have someone that you talk to, but still be lonely. Right? You may have a lot of friends, but still be lonely. And so loneliness doesn't just apply to people who have no friends. You can have a lot of friends, but still be lonely. And so loneliness is equivalent to smoking 15 cigarettes a day. <laughs> That's not good. Right? Can you imagine that? Loneliness is more lethal than obesity. We know how many uh, physical and psychological risk factors are associated with obesity. Right? Cancer, heart disease, liver problems, kidney problems, you name it, it's connected to obesity. This is why we need to lose weight. Loneliness increases the risk for depression, cognitive decline, dementia, and suicide. Loneliness adversely affects blood pressure, immune functioning, and inflammation. On the other hand, when you're not lonely, when you have a lot of uh, social connection, according to this very same study, what do they say? Having great social connections were associated with a 50%. That's a significant number, isn't it? 50% reduced risk of early death. Is that healthy or not? That's healthier than any medication, right? So social connections are good for you. This is why in the Holy Bible, what does God emphasize? Psalms 133.1, how wonderful it is, how pleasant for God's people to live together in harmony. This is why it's good that we have these gatherings, Bible study, worship service. We meet together, not just through Zoom, but live contact with one another. It's the will of God because God does not want us to be alone. It's not good physiologically. 
it's not good psychologically. However, when, when it comes to companionship, there's a special companionship that God designed for the, for the benefit of mankind. What do you think that is? <coughs> Genesis chapter 2, 21 to 23. Then the Lord God made the man fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and closed up the flesh. He formed a woman out of the rib, and he brought her to him. And the man said, at last, here is one of my own kind, bone taken from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. According to scriptures, what is a special kind of companionship that God created for the benefit of both the man and the woman? It's called marriage. This is why God created the first woman. And God wed the first woman and the first man there in the garden of Eden. And when it comes to marriage, research shows us a married couple outlives a single person. For some reason, marriage is beneficial for you. However, it depends on what kind of marriage. Yeah. <laughs> right? If you're always fighting, always quarreling, ugh, not good. This is why, what is the key for the couple, the husband and the wife, to be together and have a successful and happy marriage? Genesis as well, 2, uh, 2 24, 25. That is why a man leaves his father and mother. That's the first thing. You got to leave your in-laws, right? And is united with his wife, and they become one. The man and the woman were both naked, but they were not embarrassed. You know what the key is when it comes to having a successful marriage? It's being naked. What do you mean? No, we're not talking about that. It's being open. Nothing to hide. When you're naked, you have nothing to hide. It's about being honest with each other. It's about knowing the other person, knowing each other at such a level that there are no secrets. Right? No secrets from the past, no secrets from the present. Everything is authentic. Everything is real. That's what you call what? Intimacy. It's just a wonderful feeling when after the other person knows all of your bad stuff, Right? He or she chooses to love you anyways. It's a powerful, powerful effect on the human psyche. This is why God wants us to be naked. I mean, to be open. To be open. Right? To be authentic with one another. It is a psychological means. So we have six already. We have one more, right? What could that be? Be number seven, Genesis 2, 8 to 9. We go back to 8 to 9. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, and out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. After reading that passage, I want you to think about this while reading the passage. What do you think need number seven is? <laughs> do you see what I see? <laughs> what do you think need number seven is? I give you a hint. Garden. What was in the garden? Tree of life. You know, in this life, in this life, okay, you can have nice things. You can have a nice spouse, nice kids. You're happy. But for some reason, Deep inside, we cannot be completely happy because we know one day, all that's going to be gone, right? It's the existential struggle of knowing that one day you're all going to die. We're all going to die, right? And so we have this need for security. Security for our eternity, right? That's why in the Garden of Eden, God provided the tree of life. The garden represented the security of life. Everlasting Adam and Eve were meant to live forever. But they messed up. And all of us were affected. <laughs> right? And so what we need is some kind of garden and a tree of life. Right? We need security. And so what is our security? If we don't have paradise with us now, what do we need? Next slide. 1 Peter 1, 3 to 4. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his great mercy, he gave us new life by raising Jesus Christ from death. This fills us with a living hope. 
And so we look forward to possessing the rich blessings that God keeps for his people. He keeps them for you in heaven where they cannot decay or spoil or fade away. We lost paradise. We lost the tree of life. But guess what? God gave us hope. God gave us hope. What is the basis of that hope? God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And when he raised him back to life, a new hope, a living hope was given to us. What is this living hope about? We look forward to possessing the rich blessings that God keeps us for, for ourselves. God is preparing the riches that we will inherit in the kingdom of heaven. We don't have the actual eternal life here with us now, but we have hope for it. And so it gives us what? Security. We are secured because we know even if we die, we're going to live again and we're going to be with God in the kingdom of heaven. That's what you call security through Christ Jesus. So next slide, we have seven psychological needs in Genesis number um, two. Number one is what? Rest. Number two, spirituality, connection with God, awareness of his presence. Number three, enjoyment, learning to enjoy life within bounds, of course. Number four, the commands of God, knowing what God wants us to do, what God wants us to keep away from. What else? Work, meaning doing war, meaningful work that is for the benefit of people, benefit of others. What else? Companionship, including marriage. And number seven, what is that? Security. And to summarize the seven, next slide, we can say happiness is when you have someone to love who loves you back, right? Work to do that makes a difference and something to look forward to. That basically encapsulates the seven needs mentioned there in the book of Genesis chapter two. None of us, I'm excited about the last part. We have something to look forward to. What is that? Because when paradise was taken away from us, God has a better paradise. We have the hope for that. But there's something I want all of us to understand and to learn so that we can strengthen our hope that we will have life everlasting through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is why I wanted to focus on need number seven, which is security, perfect security. In the Garden of Eden, it was represented by the tree of life, the Garden of Eden. And so I wanted to know, next slide. What is this, by the way? What is that? That's not the Garden of Eden. It's a picture <laughs> that's supposed to represent the Garden of Eden. Nobody knows what it's look, it looks like. But I can venture to say it probably looks way better than that. Right? What do you think? I think so. God's imagination is limitless. Right? <laughs> it looks kind of nice anyways. But the question I want to ask all of you is this. Next slide. Where is the Garden of Eden located? Do you know where it's at? How many here want to guess? When you ask some people, last couple of uh, years ago, I went to a conference where all these scientists and Bible people met. And some of them suggested, next slide, oh, the Garden of Eden is in Africa. I said, what's the proof? <laughs> and they showed the different genetic analysis and all that. Didn't make sense. But most people, you know where they believe Garden of Eden is at? Next slide. Somewhere in Iraq. Iraq. Yeah. I asked my wife this morning, <laughs> Dudung, where do you think the Garden of Eden is at? And she told me, Iraq, with confidence, as though she was so certain. Iraq, Iraq, Iraq. <laughs> Are you sure about Iraq? <laughs> Are we sure it's in Iraq? Some people believe it is. A lot of people believe it, it is, right? In the Middle East somewhere. But are we sure it's in the Middle East? It's in Iraq? Well, why do people believe that the Garden of Eden is somewhere in Iraq or in the Middle East? Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 14. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters or river heads. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. And so people go to the Bible, they look at Tigris or Tigris, they look at Euphrates, they go to the map, and what do you find? Next slide, please. 
There you go. Where is Tigris? Right there. Where is Euphrates? Right there. Where do they go together? Oh, Iraq. Therefore, you would say, the Garden of Eden is somewhere in Iraq. Is that what you did? That's what a lot of people did. However, there's a couple of big, three big problems with that. First of all, Tigris and Euphrates are not riverheads. That's one big problem. And Tigris doesn't flow towards Assyria to the east, it goes to the south. That's another big problem, right? And another problem is Tigris and Euphrates, they're not found in the original Hebrew of Genesis chapter 2. What is found in Genesis chapter 2 in the Hebrew? Next slide, please. It's not uh, Euphrates, but it is Parat. You notice there at the bottom? Euphrates is what you read, right? But at the bottom, the Strong's Concordance, it, it says Parat. And the other river, the third river, is called Hidekel. So it's not Tigris. It's not Euphrates. It is Hidekel and Parat. That's a big problem, right? Where is Hidekel and Parat? Which brings, up, brings us to the third big problem. What is that? Second Peter chapter 3, 5 to 6. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed, what does it say? Perished. Perished. Being flooded with water. So we go to the Bible. We look up Tigris and Euphrates, Hidekel, Parat. And we go to our map, which is a modern map, and explore. Expect to find the rivers mentioned in Genesis. It's not going to work. You know why? Because the world back then is different from the world today. Why? Because there was a, pl a flood. What did the flood do? It caused the whole ancient world to, be, to perish. This is why we cannot use modern rivers. <laughs> did you get that? We cannot use modern rivers to locate or pinpoint the location of the Garden of Eden. And so recent articles about the location of the Garden of Eden uh, was submitted by Ken Ham. Next slide. He's one in charge of Answers in Genesis, which is a website. And it says here, where was the Garden, where was the garden of Eden located? Most Bible commentaries state that the site of the Garden of Eden was in the Middle East. But what does Scripture actually tell us? So he goes on to the article, and he says, next slide, Calvin recognized that this, the description given in Genesis 2 concerning the location of the Garden of Eden does not fit with what is observed regarding the present Tigris and Euphrates rivers. God wor God's word makes it clear that the Garden of Eden was located where there were four rivers coming from one head. No matter how one tries to fit this location in the Middle East today, it just can't be done. Interestingly, Calvin goes on to say, from this difficulty, some would free themselves by saying that the surface of the globe may have been changed by the deluge. What's the deluge? The flood. What else? So what's his conclusion? Ultimately, we don't know where the Garden of Eden was located. To insist that the garden was located in the area around the present Tigris and Euphrates rivers is to deny the catastrophic effects of the global flood of Noah's day. So basically what he's trying to say, we don't know where the location of the Garden of Eden is at. But let's give it one more try. Is that okay? Remember, the purpose of this study is to explore, right? Not to be dogmatic, but to explore, to look into, to be curious, to ask questions, and to see what the Bible reveals. Is that okay? If we can do that, I want you to put your curious hat on. Okay, don't put on your dogmatic hat. Put on your curious hat. Let's be curious. Let's try to find out. Lord God, help us find out. Where could this Garden of Eden be? Maybe it's somewhere here in Fremont. Maybe. What if it is? Right? Could it be? I don't know. Let's go find out. How can we find out? Let's use scriptures. Genesis chapter 2 and the verses 8. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed. So the Bible says the garden is eastward in Eden. And so when you read that passage in Genesis chapter 2, verse 8, you are going to conclude the garden is somewhere where? East. East, 
but it's also in Eden. Why? Because of the word I N in. But here's the question: Is the word I N? Is the word in in the original Hebrew? I'm going to show you next slide the Hebrew. And when you look at in, when you look at the strong concordance, is there one? Is there a Hebrew word there? There's none. The word in is missing in the original Hebrew scriptures. There's no word translated in. When it says the garden is eastward in Eden. What if the garden of Eden was not in Eden? Oh. So when we look at the Hebrew of Garden of Eden, this is what it says. Next slide. It's Gan Kadem Eden. Garden to the east of Eden. Maybe the reason why many people are having trouble locating the Garden of Eden is because they're looking for it in Eden. But the Bible says when you look at the Hebrew, the garden is to the east of Eden. So when you find Eden, all you have to do is go east. And there's the Garden of Eden. You know why I believe that the Garden of Eden is not in Eden? You know why? Next slide. Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. So where's the garden? Out of Eden. Out of Eden. <laughs> But what came from Eden? The river, the water, that the, the river that watered the garden came from Eden. So the garden of Eden must be out of Eden. Does it make sense? So why is it called garden of Eden? Right? If it's out of Eden, then why is it called garden of Eden? Next, li uh, next slide, Genesis chapter 2, uh, 10 to 14. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden. And from there is parted and become four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon. It is one which skirts the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and the onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Hidekel. It is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. The fourth river is the Euphrates or the Parat River. So, why is it called the Garden of Eden when it is outside of Eden towards the east? Because what waters the garden comes from the river of Eden. What is characteristic of this river from Eden? It is one river that parts into four river heads. The Pishon, the Gihon, the Hidekel, and the Euphrates, right? Of the four river heads there, one of the four river heads will directly feed or water the Garden of Eden. I wonder which one it would be. Is it the Pishon, the Hidekel, the Gihon, or the Euphrates? Which do you think it is? I have no idea, huh? I believe it is the Pishon River. Why? Next slide. Pishon. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havila, where there is gold. And so when it says the first one, it's the most direct one. It's the one that directly waters the Garden of Eden. It is the first riverhead. It's called the Pishon. And it's the one that skirts the whole land of Havila. What does it mean when it says skirts the whole land of Havila? Yeah. It surrounds Havila. You see, I believe the Garden of Eden is in Havila. Okay, it's in Havila. So Havila is a plot of land. And in Havila is the Garden of Eden. And in Havila, it is being directly watered by the Pishon, which comes from the Eden River. Why do I believe it is Havila? Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. I'm just going to skip to Genesis 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name. Eve, because she was the mother of all living. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Right? You know, <laughs> I heard a high wish. I'm not going to get into that right now. 
we're talking about the Garden of Eden, okay? But before, remember, when God is speaking here to Eve, it was after the fall, right? Before the fall, when they were still in the garden, was Eve given that name Eve? No. When was the name Eve given to the woman? After they ate the fruit. They ate the fruit. After the fall. What did God say to Eve? He said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain, you will bring forth what? Children. This is why Adam said, I will call you what? Eve. Eve. And so they were removed from the Garden of Eden. As they were removed from the Garden of Eden, guess what? They were in the land where the Garden of Eden is at. But they were removed from the garden. Where is that land? I believe it's Havilah. You know why? Next slide. Where did Adam uh, and Ad Adam and Eve live after Eden? Eve, the Hebrew name is Hava. The Hebrew name of Eve is Hava. When you put I-L in the middle of Hava, I-L means E-L, which means God. It means God inside of Hava or Eve. Havi la. What else? Next slide. If you look at the strong concordance, what does Havila mean? This is what Havila means when you look it up in the, in the Hebrew. One that suffers pain that brings forth. Did you get that? One that suffers pain that brings forth. What does that remind you of? The curse of Eve. God said to Eve, because you ate the forbidden fruit, you're going to have suffering and pain when you have conception, when you bring forth children. And so the land outside of the garden was called Havila because it was named after the curse of Eve. Does that make sense? That's why I believe that Havila is where the garden of Eden is located. But brother, where is Havila? Right? Where's Havila? Well, we have a clue in Genesis chapter 2 and the verses uh, 10 down to 14. Now, a river went out of Eden. All we need to do is find Eden. <laughs> wow, Brother John, we can do that. How are we going to find Eden? Well, all we have to do is find the river, right? That comes out of Eden. How do we identify this long river? This river will part into four riverheads. Pishon, the Gihon, the Gihon, what does that do? It goes around the entire whole land of Cush. The Hidekel, it goes towards the east of Assyria, and nothing much is said about Prata or, Prata or Euphrates, right? So all we need to do is look for these rivers. Problem solved. But there's one big problem. Noah's flood, right? These are ancient rivers, not modern rivers. Here's my question. Where do you look for ancient rivers? Where do you look for ancient rivers that existed before the flood? Where? Yes, under the sea, right? And when you look under the sea, guess what you find? Next slide. There's a trench 40,000 miles long. It's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. And this Mid-Ocean Ridges are connected, forming a continuous, one continuous undersea mountain range about 40,000 miles long. Guess where it begins? North Pole. It goes round, uh, around Africa, towards Asia, goes underneath Australia, and ends up in North America. Do you see it? Do you see the route? It's called the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. It's underneath the sea. Remember, when we're looking for ancient rivers, we have to go underneath the sea. Not on tops of, that's not on the present land today, right? And so we have ridges. What do we find in those ridges? Next slide. You find rifts. What is a rift? It's like an opening. What are the dimensions of that rift? 1.55 miles deep. And it's 12.4 miles wide. What does that describe? A river. What is underneath the rift? Scientists will tell you, oh, what's underneath the river is lava, magma. Is that what they find? 
Next slide. When they dug, you know, there's no evidence of magma existing below the Earth's crust except in pockets. Russia drilled the, the, the deepest at seven miles and found no lava. You know what they found instead? Water. And so you have these rifts along the ridges. It follows the ridges. And so these are ancient rivers. And are these ancient rivers functioning still today? Yeah. What's the proof? Next slide. You will find hydrothermal vents along the path of these ridges. And so it's still active. Well, is this one oceanic ridge, these ridges, is it just one oceanic ridge? Does it, does it form into four heads? Next slide. It actually does. When you examine the ridges, it has its per first parting at the tip of South America. And then it goes up, it splits again to two and three, and then it splits again to go to number one to North America. And so it's one river that comes from Eden and it splits or parts into four heads. Well, what's the proof? It's only one river system. Next slide. If you check the depths of the Arctic Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Indian Ocean, Pacific Ocean, when you follow the path, it follows in consecutive order in terms of depth. In other words, it goes from deep to deeper to deeper to deepest. Why? Because the water always flows downhill. So what does that show us? There's one river system that's underneath the water that parts into four river heads. So what do we need to do now? Let's examine the four river heads to see if it fits the description in Genesis. So let's do that. Next slide. Genesis 2.14, what's the fourth river? Euphrates or Parat, right? Where is that? Next slide. And so just to show you that Euphrates, Euphrates means Parat. There's the Strong's for, or the Hebrew Strong's uh, concordance number for the one used for Euphrates. It is Parat. Next slide. So where is that river head? It's right there. After it comes from Eden, flows downhill, it becomes Parat River, and it flows all the way along the coast of South America towards Mexico. Next slide. What's the next, what's number three? The name of the third river is, what is it called? Hedekel. It is the one which goes toward the east of Assyria. Is there um, trenches that show exactly that pattern? Next slide. Let's go see. You see Hidekel? It's a, the green in color. So once it parted to become Parat, it also parts to become the Hidekel River. And where is Hidekel River towards? East of Assyria. It's going east towards Assyria. So it fits the description. Next slide. How about the second river? The name of the second river is Gihon. And what is unique about Gihon? It is the one which goes around the whole land of Kush. What is Kush? What is Kush? It's somewhere in Africa. What is Kush? Ethiopia. When it says goes around the whole land of Kush, it refers to the whole continent of Africa. Okay? Because it doesn't make sense for a river to go around just Kush. That's why it says the whole land of Kush. So next slide. What river is that? Right there. Oops. Go back, please. Go back. There you go. Right? To the land of Kush. It's in orange or pink. That's the Gihon River. Is there a trench system that goes around it? Yes. And take note, all of this is connected to the Eden River. All of this is connected to the Mid-Oceanic Ridge. Next slide. And what's the other, the first um, river? Its name is Pishon. And it skirts the whole land of Havila. What is Havila? That's where Eden, or the Garden of Eden is located. Next slide. And so where is that? It goes underneath Australia. It goes to North America or Mexico. And then it becomes what? The Pishon River. Do you see the, uh, what color is that? It's not blue. What color is that? Teal. The teal color. Right? And so let's go in depth. Next slide. 
that there are trenches all over there, varying in depths, which is why the river flowing in the ancient river, it was skirting around Havila. And guess where Havila is? Huh? What is it so? What is it? It surrounds the Philippine archipelago. Look at that. Havila, brethren, is the Philippines. Ancient Havila, where the Garden of Eden is located, is in the Philippines. Well, how can we know that? Is that east of Eden? Well, for us to answer that, we need to first identify where Eden is at, right? Next slide. We know where the river begins, up there. And if you look at the mid-oceanic ridge, it connects you all the way to the beginning, which is the North Pole. So Eden is at the North Pole. The water starts from Eden, goes around, and ends up there, the end. It becomes Pishon, and Pishon surrounds Havila, where the Philippines is at. So North Pole is where Eden is. Where is the east of Eden? Next slide. We have to look into a different map because the North Pole is included. We can't use the regular map that we use. This is what the ancients use, a map where the center is the North Pole. And from this version of the map, next slide, we know where North Pole is. And this is a map which shows the different territories of the three sons of Noah. And we'll talk about that when we go to chapter 10 and chapter 11 of Genesis. And it describes how the planet Earth is divided into territories belonging to the three sons of Noah, Japheth, Shem, and Ham. So Eden is right in the middle. And if you notice at the border of Shem's territory, what do you find? What is that country? Towards the east. Philippines. Next slide. This is why the Havila, east of Eden, is the Philippines. And it is watered by a river that comes from Eden or the North Pole. But brother, are you sure about that? We have to look for more clues. Is that okay? So we have the trench system pointing to Havila as the Philippines. But is there additional proof? Actually, there are. Next slide. Genesis chapter 2, 11 and 12. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havila, where there is what? Gold. And the gold of that land is good. So this place called Havila, it is known for its good gold. What does that mean? What is the meaning of the word good? Next slide. From the strongest concordance, it means good, better, best, rich, prosperity, precious, fine, pure, wealth, beautiful, rich, prosperous, bountiful, abundant. So this place called Havila is plentiful, abounding, bountiful in gold. Do you know of any countries known for its gold? Philippines was the uh, gold, world's number one gold producer in the, before the... That's right. Next slide. Yeah. Independent confirmation of the Philippines. Gold. When it comes to gold, the number one producer before the war was the Philippines. Philippines is known for its gold. Up to now, it's known for its gold. Ferdinand Marcos became famous because of his gold that came from the Philippines, which up to now is still in the Philippines. And some went to the Swiss uh, bank. So the Philippines is known for its gold. Since when was the Philippines known for its gold? Next slide. And I conduct research from God Culture, and they produced this series called Search for Solomon's Gold. And I recommend that you watch the YouTube series. Um, I don't completely agree with everything they say, but like what we do when we do research, we test everything. And what is good, we keep. What is not good, we throw out, right? So, you know, I recommend you watching uh, Search for Solomon's Gold, and you'll be astounded with the, the, the abundance of information and research material all pointing to the Philippines as a major country, major place in the Bible. So according to these resources, gold jewelry, of the Phil of Philippine origin has been found in first century Egypt. Remember, the Philippines did not become Philippines until the Spaniards came and gave us the name 
Philippines. But even way before that, the Philippines has been exporting gold. And if you read the Bible, even before that, the Philippines has been exporting gold. So when it comes to gold, the Philippines is the country to be. But it's not only gold. What else? Genesis again, 2, 11, and 12. There is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Delium is there. You know what delium is? Delium. How many here love oysters? What do oysters produce? Delium. Pearls. What country is known for its pearls? The Philippines. That's why the Philippines is called what? The Pearl of the Orient. Next slide. The largest pearl in the world was found in 2006 in the Philippines. The second largest also found in the Philippines. The larger the pearl, the, oldest, the older it is. The oldest pearls, the biggest pearls, the most numerous pearls are found in the Philippines. The third largest, the fourth largest, the fifth largest, the sixth largest. It's not even fair. They're all found where? Philippines. That's why when you, when you look for a country known for its pearls, it's the Philippines. So gold, plentiful in the Philippines. Pearl, plentiful in the Philippines. What else? Next slide. Onyx stone. Is that also plentiful in the Philippines? Next slide. Onyx stone, right? Romblon. Marble is noted to be the strongest marble in the world. That's why they have black onyx and green onyx. They put, they put that together and create marble. Strongest in the world. Stronger than even the one in Italy. So when it comes to the strongest onyx stone, it is in Philippines. And so to kind of summarize, next slide, number one in gold, number one in pearl, number one in onyx stone, where is it? Philippines. And it's surrounded by trenches that depict the Pishon River. Hmm. I think that's a pretty good case for the Philippines to be Havila, the place of the Garden of Eden. But let's look for more clues. Genesis chapter 7, 21 to 22. Every creature that crawls on earth died, including birds, domestic and wild animals, and everything that swarms over the earth, along with every human. Everything on dry land, every living, breathing creature died. You notice what did not die? What remained alive? What's not on land? Fish. Fish. Marine animals. They did not perish. They did not die. Why? Well, because they live in the water, right? So not a lot of them died. And so if, if we assume, if we believe the Philippines is the place of creation, place of marine life, right? What can we expect about the Philippines' biodiversity? Next slide. According to the Carpenter Report, 2005 Philippines is not only part of the center, but is in fact the epicenter of marine biodiversity with the richest concentration of marine life on the entire planet. It's the center of marine life in the entire planet. What does CNN say? Next slide. 2012, the Philippines sits at the heart of the Coral Triangle, the global center of marine biodiversity, about halfway between the provinces of Batangas and Mindoro, the Verde Island Passage, boasts the highest concentration of marine species in the planet. Not only marine animals when it comes to fruits and vegetables and unique creatures philippines palladium and other minerals philippines the philippines is so rich in resources this is why i believe that it is it is havila but there's one more reason I want to share with you why I believe the Philippines is Havila. You know, want to know what it is? Next slide. There are three biblical places that you find in the Bible again and again and again. And it fits a description of the Philippines. We're not going to study that today because it's going to be way too much. Okay. But there are three biblical places that fit the description of the Philippines. What are they? Next slide. Ophir. Sheba and Tarshish. Is Ophir in the Bible? Yes. Is Sheba in the Bible? Yes. Is Tarshish in the Bible? Yes. 
And when we go to the Bible, we're going to find that Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish, they're all in the Philippines. And the reason why we're going to study that and learn all about that is because I want you to understand that the Philippines has a Hebrew lineage. We can trace our ancestry all the way to the Hebrew people, descendants of Shem, and also to the first couple, Havila. I guess everyone can say that, right? But to Shem, to Joktan, to Ophir, Sheba, and the Hebrew people. Filipinos are actually Ophirians. Filipinos are actually Hebrew when it comes to their lineage. Ophir, Sheba, and Tarshish. Where are they located? Next slide. The isles at the ends of the earth. Again, this is all biblical. We're not going to get into the, the biblical description today. We're, you don't have enough time. But Ophir is the northern part of the Philippines. Sheba is the middle. And Tarshish, the third part, Mindanao area. Ophir, Sheba, Tarshish, they all form Havila, the land of creation. The isles at the end of the earth. What is the significance of Ophir? Next slide. Solomon. Remember Solomon? He was building what? The temple. And he needed materials, especially what? Gold. And so in verse uh, 1 Kings 9, 26, 28, and King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Geber, which is beside Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea, in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent in the navy, sent in the navy his servants, shipmen that has knowledge of the sea. With the servants of Solomon. And they came to, where is that? Ophir, and fetched from thence gold, 420 talents, and brought it to King Solomon. How long was that journey? We read, read the Bible. It's a three year journey east beyond the Arabian Sea to a multitude of islands. That is where Ophir is at. It is composed of a multitude of islands to the east beyond the Arabian Sea that takes three years by ship. Philippines. There can be no other. So from Ophir, where are they going to get? Go. To build what? The temple of God. Next slide. And so Sheba responds. And Sheba was amazed with the wisdom of Solomon. Right? And they have this interaction between Sheba. And we'll talk about Sheba and how it's related to Sibu. Because Sibu was originally spelled Sebu. S with a letter S. Okay. And we'll talk about that in other episodes. But Sheba responds to King Solomon and she gives him gold from Ophir. Okay. What else is the significance of Ophir? Next slide. Remember Noah? I mean, if Havila is in the Philippines, then the descendants of Adam and Eve up to Noah, they probably would still be in. Yeah, they should be in the Philippines. We have proof of that. Well, in Genesis 6.14, it says, Make thee an ark made of what? Gopher wood. When you research gopher wood, you're not going to find it. It's not in the Bible. It's not, in any, it's not a Hebrew word. But many scholars find that when you look deep enough, it's not really gopher wood. It is ophir wood. And ophir is another alternative for the spelling of Ophir. It is Ophir wood that was in Havila during the time of Noah. And what wood is that? They call it the Nara tree. Because after a while, when Sheba was there, Nara, the national tree of the Philippines, the word Nara, believe it or not, it's not Tagalog. It's Hebrew. Did you know in the Philippines they have mountains called Havila? They have places called Havila. When you look at all the mountains of the Philippines, 99% is Hebrew. Nara, the tree, is Hebrew, not Tagalog, not Spanish. Hebrew, what does it mean? It means she must be admired in reference to Queen of Sheba. That was the tree, the Ophir wood that was used by Noah. Mount Arayat, you know what that means in Hebrew? Earth. Covered. Coincidence? I don't think so. 
And so when we look at the pattern, next slide, right? Philippines, that was when the first days of creation were made. Philippines, that's where the materials to build Noah's Ark came from. Philippines, that's where the materials, the gold used to build a temple came from. You see the pattern? And so in the last days of creation, our time, if you look at the pattern, do you think something significant is going to happen in the Philippines? Look at the provided materials to build Noah's Ark. What does the Noah's Ark represent? What does it represent? Enter in, you're saved, right? What does that represent? Yeah, the body of Christ. The temple. What does the temple represent? What did Apostle Paul say? You are the temple of God. What is that? Body of Christ. The ark represents the body of Christ. The temple represents the body of Christ. And so when the last days will come, what will happen? Next slide. The last days of creation will begin the work of building the body of Christ also in the Philippines. You know, God culture, they're not members of the church, right? We don't even know them. But the researchers, next slide, the researchers of God culture, the producer of Solomon's Gold, after all the research and all their findings, they made one conclusion after that. You know what it is? Next slide. They said there will be a John the Baptist figure that will come from the Philippines in the last days. That's the conclusion. Who is John the Baptist? The second Elijah. If there's going to be another John the Baptist that will come from the Philippines in the last days, he'll be the third Elijah. You know who the third Elijah was? Next slide. This is from Kaerdi's sermon. This is a quote. Therefore, Kaerdi says, the work of this Elijah would be restoration. Brother Felix Y. Manalo fulfilled this work when he restored us from the apostate church to be the true church of Christ. Hence, Brother Felix Y. Manalo is the third Elijah who would restore all things before the second coming of Christ and the church of Christ is the fulfillment of restoration and last mission of salvation. Who is the third Elijah? Brother Felix Y. Manalo. We already know who it is. He was already in completion of his mission to preach the word of God, to bring about the other sheep of Christ, to be brought together, to become one flock. It was fulfilled July 27, 1914. However, the work of restoration is not complete. This is what Kaerdi also said in that same worship service lesson. Next slide. Members of the church of Christ in these last days are extremely fortunate to see the dawning of Christ's second coming or judgment day. However, we are not to predict how close we are to that day since we do not know what is encompassed by the words restore all things. Only God will determine whether there are still other things to be restored before God already died. He knows there are other things that have to be restored, right? And so he said, when it says all things have to be restored, we don't know what is included there. When it says restore all things, this is why, brethren, we believe God's Spirit is working with us and He will reveal to us the things that still need to be restored. This is why we invite you in our future Bible studies, future worship services, as we reveal this with the help of our God through the Scriptures what needs to be restored. But restoration means our security. And if you want to be secure, the, uh, the last messenger, he always pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He always pointed to God. He says, do not believe in Manala. You want to have perfect security? This is what Christ said. We're almost done. John 10, 27, 29. My sheep listen to my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. If we want perfect security, if we want security for everlasting life, what do we need to do? We need to follow Christ. We need to make him our shepherd. Not any human being here on earth, but the chief shepherd 
our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to go to him and look to him, and we need to follow him. If we will do that, Christ guarantees our security. He says, I will give you eternal life, and no one and nothing can snatch you out of my hands. No one and nothing can snatch you out of my Father's hands. That's perfect security. Do you know why? That none of us will ever be snatched from the hand of Christ, the hand of God. Do you know why? Let's read the final passage of our study today, Romans 8, 38, 39. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love. Let's pause there for a while. Why will no one be able to snatch us from our Lord Jesus Christ's hand, from the Father's hands? Because the Father's hands and the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ holds us with the grip of love. And that grip of love, no one will be able to snatch us away from the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. When it says no one can snatch us away from God, from our Lord Jesus Christ, what does it include? Either death, nor life, even if you die, you will not be separated. Neither angels, nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future. Neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is our perfect security. In the hand of God, in the hand of Christ. Because when we belong to them, when they hold us tightly, we will never be able, we will never be snatched by anyone, by anything. Gracious be to our almighty God. Let us all stand and we shall pray together. Everlasting, gracious God in heaven, thank you so much for giving us a powerful testimony concerning our future, our security. We have so much to look forward to. And we have come to this conclusion as we look back and examine what you have done in the past. How you have created everything from the very beginning. You always thought of us, what we need in our life, physical and psychological needs. You want us to be happy. You want us to be complete, to enjoy life even here on earth. Because you are a good God, beneficent God who loves his people so much. Amen. You have provided everything, even your own son, yes. who died on the cross, that we might have a living hope. Yes. And so we have so much to look forward to, yes. no matter what happens in our life. Yes. You are there for us. Yes. Never leave us, oh God. Yes. This life can be tough. We have to endure many things. Yes. Insults, oppressions, and persecutions. Yes. They abound in our life. But when we are close to you, when we feel your presence, we are never shaken. We remain standing because you are good and you are our Father, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. You are our chief shepherd. We will follow you wherever you may lead us. We're willing to endure all things to remain your sheep. Only help us and guide us every day of our life. May we taste your goodness. May we see you working in our life as we continue to pursue our God. Father, please forgive our sins. Remember your people all over the world. Bless always the family of Brother Eran Yamanalo. Those who are falsely accused in prison, may you give them liberation. Give us all protection. The kindness coming from you. Thank you so much, Father. Yes. We know that you have something wonderful yes. prepared for each one of us yes. on the day when you will send your Son. Amen. This is our hope, O oh Father, and our prayer in faith, in the name of our Lord and Savior.